Sure, why don't we just go off the, um, the non movie version and then uh, magic? Well, they're there, so we'll just see. So. And, uh, let me ask you a small trivia question. Okay, so uh, what's uh, common to Chip Kelly, Tommy Retro, Wired, uh, Joe Montana, probably in Paul Mac, uh, Shane Turk, uh, distinguished professor of technology, society at MIT, um, Jane Rosenthal, Chris Alaska, no voting. <laughs> I kind of don't mention his jersey number. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Jay Rosenthal, uh, producer and co-founder of Tribeca, and also Phil Rosedale, co-founder, I mean the founder of Second Life. All these people have something in common. So that's a question. What's the trivia question here? One beer for anybody who gets it without Googling. Sir, you owe me a beer for that. I have several beers at this point. Okay, Chip K. Joe Montana, Sherry Turkle, Jane Rosenthal, Chip Rose, Philip Rose. Okay, you all have something in common with our speaker for today. So, Jeremy's latest book, which is coming out this January, is already a lot of acclaim in uh, both the academic as well as popular press. And every one of these people has come up with blurbs on how impressive it is. So, that's a trivia question there. So. It gives me great pleasure here to have Jeremy Valenson. Uh, this is not the first time in Lunatic Gainesville. Uh, he's been here in the business school before. He said in 2002 for an interview, Chris and Co. did not hire him, so now we are hoping that we can put on a good show and make an offer that he can't refuse. So, uh, welcome to Florida. Um, Jeremy is a cognitive psychologist by training. Uh, then he got his postdoc in social psychology and now with the postdoc communication, whose work extends to so many different disciplines. Uh, 
uh, to me it gives so much pleasure to see someone in communication exerting so much influence at so many different levels because work is something which is appealing to academic militant but also something which a lot of lay people also uh, really fall upon so there's also evidenced by uh, the amount of press coverage is got in popular media as well including TED talks um, uh, traffic other festivals um, and also the fact that he is just such a prolific publisher so he's published in just about every single journal in motion social sciences going beyond that in computer science and medicine uh, has articles in plus one and science uh, so really someone whose work has reached so many different diverse audiences and to talk at all um, he's a really nice guy too so mm -hmm. and what's really the hallmark of so much of jeremy's work is it's also clearly rooted in good methodology good clean experimental designs all the night towards testing theory so uh, there's a lot that we can learn and uh, I'm especially proud that some of the communication sciences are really being on the forefront of virtual reality. And today, uh, I would not be wrong in saying that he's a leading virtual reality scientist in the world. So, welcome to James Will. We're glad to have you here. Sri, how do you say you're here? How do you say the PowerPoint for here? Oh. Oh, yeah, that was on. <laughs> so thank you, Shri, uh, for inviting me here for that lovely introduction. Um, thank to all of you for being really patient with my time change. I had uh, uh, I fought the airlines and lost today, and ended up about three hours later than I should have. So I apologize for having to change your schedules. Really thank you all for being here. Um, great. So um, the thought process for today is really this book I've been working on for about three years. It's really a, it's been consuming the way that I've been thinking about VR. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is kind of a narrative that's emerged from really trying to put my work in a framework and really put in more of a what should we do with VR framework uh, for society. So uh, for the next 45 minutes, um, uh, we're going to talk about what VR is, how it works a little bit, and really talk about why this is a very special moment in time, economically and historically. I'm then going to go over about, you know, about a dozen experiments that we've run in the lab, the basic theme of which is when you go in VR, it's an intense experience, brain treats are kind of like a real experience, and it changes the way you think later on, it changes the way you act. So these studies in, a various, in, in many domains show that you have a VR experience and it changes you. And then what we're going to do, and why I love the field of communication, I'm just, just delighted to be a scholar in the comm department, we're allowed to do stuff, right? You know, we're encouraged to take our research and, and to focus it outward. And so we're going to spend the last 15 minutes talking about experiments that became products, products that governments are using, products that companies are using, and really taking the work that we do in labs and turning them into things that people can use to enrich their daily lives. Uh, uh, and leave a lot of time for question and answer. So how many guys have um, been in VR before? How many of you have walked, not just looked? Okay, about, uh, about 10%. So flashback to the year 2001, and Jim Blaskovich, my postdoc mentor, and I would fly to Washington, D.C., and we are giving a presentation to at the Federal Judicial Center to federal judges and high-end lawyers about how you can use VR in the courtroom. For example, can you use it to recreate a crime scene? Can you have an eyewitness look at a police lineup inside to identify suspects? And uh, while we're there, we always give fun demos. The funnest demo we have is called the pit. Okay? And what the pit is, a person puts on the helmet and he looks around. And we build a 3D model that looks just like the, the room that she's in. We then get a button and we drop a chasm. Okay? This chasm is about 10 meters deep. It goes about 2 meters across. And there's a really plank that crosses over. And what you have to do while you're in there is just walk across this piece of wood and get to the other side. So this is a, the, one of the more fun demos one can do in VR. It's, it's typically how we lead our demo sessions. So back in 2001, there's 500 people in the room. Again, all lawyers and judges. And a gentleman comes up. He's a federal judge. Probably weighs uh, 260, 270 pounds. He's in his late 60s, I think. And as he's walking across the plank, he just takes a little bit of a step to the right by accident. And we model gravity, so he plummets towards the bottom of that chasm. Now, question for you guys, if you're in the physical world, 
and this happens, how do you save your life? You dive at a 45 degree angle to try to catch the other one with that lip. Okay. So this judge, in the middle of this conference, just dove at a 45 degree angle. Now it gets worse. This is my first public demo. I literally demo 2,000, 5,000 people a year through the VR. My first public demo, I had my hard drive sitting on a table in a really sharp corner. Okay? So this guy dives, and his face is about to hit this corner, and my one move is to dive at him and to knock him over to redirect his trajectory so he didn't cut his face off. He was fine. Okay? Um, so no one got hurt. Him. He was a good sport about it, and he sued me. I ended up in jail. But the point of this long story is to illustrate something called presence. Presence is defined by communication scholars as the illusion of non-mediation. When VR works, there's no gadgets, there's no field of view, there's no pixels, it's just an experience. And that reaction that I described to you with technology that's now 17 years old, I get that reaction every day. VR feels real, the brain treats it as real. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about, you shouldn't think VR is a media experience. Yes, we study media, but in my humble opinion, if you're going to think about the proper way to incorporate VR into your life, into your research, into your products, treat it as an actual experience. That judge, the real world didn't exist. Everything was in VR for him, and that is called presence. So my lab is considered by most technologically uh, at Stanford to be one of the best in the world. Uh, I can brag about that because my amazing students do all the work. It's really not me. Uh, it's got a really sensitive tracking system that can track their arms and legs to one tenth millimeter accuracy. We have an array of 24 speakers that can spatialize sound so that if a bird flies by, you actually get the sound from it. Uh, we have a floor that shapes uh, using a, a, a piston system based on low-frequency speakers. We have virtual scent. Uh, we have touch devices that um, it's a destination. <coughs> that being said, my lab is becoming completely obsolete as a physical destination. Uh, it, the hardware on the consumer side is it's just coming like a freight train. So uh, I'll tell a story. In March 2014, Mark Zuckerberg came to my lab. Uh, we spent about three hours together. He got demos using our, our high-end system. We talked about the applications in terms of poverty, in terms of communication and entertainment and, and the training. And um, so Zuck leaves. And then two weeks later, my daughter, Edie's born, my second daughter. It's amazing. As a tenured faculty member, I plan on working 10-hour weeks and, and just enjoying my lovely daughter. And the day after Edie's born, Zuck buys this little company called Oculus that no one had heard of yet. They had no consumer product. They had very little IP. Uh, they never uh, made a profit or in any year for what we now know to be $3 billion. Okay, $3 billion. So the New York Times runs a front page article on the business section saying the business of balance of lab in part causes up to buy Oculus. And since then, I've been working 16 hour days, uh, six days a week, bags under my eyes, running around. You know, it's, it's, it's a very special moment in time. So uh, I can promise you, I work with all these companies in some form or other. Uh, each of these companies is spending eight or nine figure budgets on their VR products. It is too big to fail. It's, you know, there's a, all of them taking slightly different approaches, but all of these guys working really hard to get VR in their living rooms. And uh, it's, a, it's a special moment in time because this is the media medium we've been studying for quite some time. And uh, things that you know used to cost. So uh, if you go to my website and read my published work, I would say 80% of my papers. The subjects in these experiments were wearing these guys. Each one costs more than my car and weighs uh, so much that afterwards your neck hurts. What we're using now costs less than a fancy dinner and uh, light and fluffy and comfortable. And we're now at the point where we can literally put thousands of people in VR at once uh, and we can pull this off technologically and we can pull this off economically. So it's a very special moment where <laughs> VR that makes you feel like you are transported mentally is free and cheap. But a lot of you in this room, this is a great room because most of you have done VR, uh, you're probably like my grandfather. This is Popper, he's 92 years old. And I put him in VR and he looked around and he said, this, this is pretty cool. What, 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 what's the point? Okay? And most of you have probably done VR and said, I can see someday that, that that's kind of cool, but what's the point? And really that's what this book is about. And and the, the anybody recognize the novel that this is the cover of? Cash 22. Thank you. So it's about paradox. The brain treats it as real. Remember that judge dove into a table 
in front of all of his peers. But there's no rules. You can turn gravity on and off. You can travel forward in time. You can become a different person. You can scale your walking movements. You can grow a third arm. There's no rules. But if you do some intense, weird, novel experience, the brain treats it as real. So we're in a very special realm now where you can build the impossible, but the brain is not yet evolved. To quote my colleague by a reason, but mess, the brain has not yet evolved to differentiate from compelling virtual experiences than they are from physical ones. So here's my thing. VR is not free. What does that mean? Forget money for a second. VR is not free. It's First of all, it's really distracting. Uh, you're going to step on cats, you're going to get mugged on subways, you're going to walk into walls. It physically takes you away from the room. So it's not something you want to be doing all the time. So it's distracting. Uh, it produces something called simulator sickness. If those of you that have worn VR for a long time, uh, your eyes start to hurt, you get a little dizzy. It's going to be addictive. right? When social networking feels like the best party you've ever been to, when online gambling feels like going to Las Vegas, when pornography feels like sex, how is it as a society can function when we've got these the virtual experiences at the touch of phone. We can talk about behavioral modeling, meaning when you get the muscle memory from, from doing very bad things that you're <coughs> currently doing video games like this, how does that going to affect the brain? So VR is not free. There's a lot of downsides to using VR. Therefore, we shouldn't use it for everything. We should save it for things that are impossible, dangerous, counterproductive, or really expensive or rare. I'm going to go over each of those uh, one at a time. Impossible. The first line of research I'm going to talk about today is changing our identity, becoming a woman, becoming a person of color, walking a mile in someone else's shoes to really feel what it's like to be that person. You can't do that in the physical world. Dangerous. Why do we have VR? Because in the late 1920s, a guy named Edwin Lake said, I want to learn how to fly, and I don't want to do it from a handbook. You learn by doing. Mistakes are how we learn, but in flying, mistakes are really expensive. People die. Planes are crashed. So the flight simulator, which has been around for quite some time, is the epitome of why you have VR for things that are dangerous. Counterproductive. Um, the old adage of uh, father catches his teenage son smoking cigarettes, forces him to go in the closet and smoke a carton. You learn a great life lesson there, but it's probably pretty bad for your lungs. In VR, you get the best of both. You can learn these intense lessons by doing things that are probably not good for you, and the brain gets the lesson that the body doesn't get off. And the last one, which is probably most of the, the, the largest category for the applications you see today, are just things that are really expensive. So pre this consumer revolution, one of the, uh, the one, of, one of the three ways people were making money in VR back in the day was treating phobias, and one of the most uh, successful ones of those was uh, public speaking. So right now, there's a hundred of you in this room. If I wanted to train to be a better speaker, hiring a hundred actresses would be expensive. So uh, an expensive, rare one that works pretty well. To sum up, VR is not free. It's going to be addictive, it kind of hurts your eyes, you don't know where you are in the room, and you're probably going to learn some pretty bad lessons when you do the type of content that we all like to play and all like to watch. So save it for things that are expensive, dangerous, counterproductive, or impossible. Uh, another way of saying this, in three years from now, if you guys are checking your email in VR, then you know I've done a bad job as an advocate for my view of VR. Meaning that is not why we go to VR. You don't go to VR to read your email. Like, mm -hmm. This works just fine. Um, so, uh, so the first line of research I want to talk about is uh, teaching diversity and empathy. And so in 2003, uh, to fund the lab, I was working with a company called Cisco. And Cisco, uh, the project manager is a brilliant woman named Marcia Satowski. She said, Jeremy, the way that we train for diversity now is we have people role play when they watch actors on, on, on a stage or they do uh, case studies that they read about. Can you come up with a better way to do diversity training? And what was born in 2003 in our lab, I'd see mirrors in other labs, so I'm not claiming credit for the mirror of VR, uh, was what we call the race mirror the first time that we built it. It leverages two theories. One is called the contact hypothesis, a sociological theory. The second is called body transfer. So the contact hypothesis, to really make it simple, if you take out groups, you put them together in a context where they can basically work on something together, they're going to learn to get along. When you take blacks and whites and put them in the same schools, uh, they're going to learn to get along. That's the contact hypothesis. Body transfer is a neuroscience description of a process in which the part of the brain that has the schema from a self expands to include other things like rubber hands or canes. And uh, there's a famous study by Urson published in 2006 that showed that if there's an avatar and you do the proper what's called synchronous movements, meaning a person moves the avatar moves with it, or a stick hits the visual avatar and somebody feels a poke, you can basically expand that brain section that includes the 
rather than section of self to include the other. So what we did is combine the two and said, well, what instead of being around an out group, you become one. And so in our studies here, somebody walks up to a virtual mirror, I see myself as a white male, and I gesture in front of the mirror for about two to four minutes. I see the synchronous movements, I have to go through all sorts of movements. Maybe we, we did a book where uh, you then bend down so that you can't see yourself in the mirror, and then you come up and you're a woman of color, or you're 65 years old, or you're just a different person. You then repeat the body transfer to further hammer home the fact that the identity has changed, and then you network in a second person into VR, and that person does horrible things to you, says horrible things to you, uh, sometimes assaults you about your race, about your gender. So you're wearing the body of someone else, and you experience this trauma firsthand. And um, in writing the new book, I had the pleasure of uh, reading every single paper that's ever been done in this domain, because in addition to my group, who's been doing this for uh, good 15 years, Mel Slater's group does some, and, and uh, our own Shri has done a very nice uh, uh, demonstration of people with mental illness uh, a good decade ago, and so uh, I got the pleasure of reviewing the work uh, in this area. And what I can say is, so in my lab we've looked at using this to, for race, we've looked at it for gender, we've looked for ageism, we've looked at it for discrimination against the handicap, uh, let me actually give you an example of a recent study we published. Um, Sun Juan is a professor at the University of Georgia. Her dissertation had people go through a very difficult sorting task. And they either did it while imagining they were visually impaired, or they did it while I used the HMD to literally take away their ability to see well. So they became impaired, or they imagined they were impaired. And she did a number of methods. The first is she looked at if you're actually going to help someone who is impaired, not say you're going to help, we rarely trust self-report in the domain to these difficult behaviors to change. Uh, so what she did was she had people sit down, go to the web, and this is after the paper study, and find websites that would be difficult to see if you're impaired, and email the webmasters and ask the webmaster to change the font, uh, to change the color schemes, etc. So the one who is impaired would be able to see better. When you become impaired, you spend twice as much time helping others than when you imagine. Uh, and that's the type of study that we run. We've looked at race, we've looked at again, it's, uh, discrimination against women, uh, and, and lots of domains. We probably pu published 20 studies in my lab. In general, VR works better than influence. What I can say across the studies, VR uh, compared to imagining it, watching a video, works better than control conditions. It doesn't work in every single study. And in a given study, say if you have three dependent variables, it doesn't always work in every DV. So I want to be really careful in talking about how robust these results are. Uh, in general, VR very consistently outperforms controls, but it's not, um, you know, in this new, with this new age of statistical uh, descriptions of studies, and especially in it's so important, uh, it's important to be careful about. Uh, so this is Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, and Adam came to the lab because he wanted to learn about gaining you know, billions of more fans by putting people courtside in VR. And he arrived at the lab and I said, I, I, I don't think that's a good idea. You get people dizzy, you know, it turns out the camera people are very good at those angles. Um, but they stayed for two hours, and in particular, Eric Hutcherson, the head of human resources for the NBA, he was very taken by this, this idea of, can we use VR for, you know, making NBA people, not just players, people more aware and more tolerant of these situations. And, we had a very public dialogue about that. And then Roger Goodell, who's the head of the National Football League, to his credit, he came to the lab not to gain more viewers because he wanted the NFL to be the leading organization of having very visible people thinking more deeply about these issues. And I'm very proud to say, as of uh, five months ago, February, combine was in February, six months ago. Um, at the NFL Combine, Combine is where scouts and managers interview players. Um, we trained the GMs and we trained the scouts using an interview simulator. So uh, think of it like a flight simulator. Let's practice having conversations, difficult conversations, intense conversations where mistakes are free. And we built what I believe to be the most realistic virtual human dialogue system. I know we've got some of Ben Mox in the room that I just met, and uh, uh, I think that you know, you'll love to see the way that we did this. Um, uh, but we're using it out of the field, and these people are actually getting better and not making mistakes while asking questions. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing a lot of work. What the, the big thinker in this on the NBA, on the NFL side, is a guy named Troy Vincent, who's the vice president of operations. And they just really need to watch you know, this organization take this seriously. And what I loved, and this was Troy's decision, was not to start with the players, not to pick on the players. Let's start with the owners, and let's start with the executives. And that's been really fun to watch.
How many of you guys are going to read the talk tomorrow? Fantastic. Uh, meaning, uh, that was because uh, then I will talk about this, which was my fun. Uh, so let's shift away from uh, and being out for and I want to talk about the environment. About, I mean, I would love it if you all came to talk tomorrow, but uh, uh, I'm going to talk about something that I will now also talk about tomorrow. Uh, so one of my academic heroes is a woman named Jane Lopchenko, Dr. Jane Lopchenko. Uh, she was the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration under President Obama for four years. Uh, in that four year period, there was more natural disasters, droughts, floods, tornadoes, things of that nature, than any other four year window in US history. Okay. Scientists, of course, and you know, and, and coming to Florida, uh, I don't need to tell you guys, um, there's a reason for this intensity of the storms and the frequency of the storms. Uh, scientists believe it's due to climate change, but a major portion of the population does not. And how do you bridge that? And what Dr. Lopchenko says, and she, this is a quote that, um, that uh, I like, when people directly experience something, they see it in a different light. So I interviewed her for the book. She's uh, one of the heroes of the, the chapter called Worldview on uh, Using Very Healthy Environment. And she tells this amazing story of going, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna say the lawmaker's name, a very prominent lawmaker who is a climate change denier. A disaster hit his hometown, and Jane had a heartbreaking job. She has to visit these places that have been devastated by natural disaster. It's a great job because she gets to help them. Right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an intense experience. And she tells the story of this lawmaker who, after the disaster had hit his town, he literally says, quote, I have become a believer. I have seen the light. Meaning, because this disaster hit his town, he now believes in climate change. And, and again, for, in this room, uh, you know, the, the Republican Congress makers from Florida believe in climate change. Right? Why is that? Because their districts are having these experiences. So when you experience something, you see it in a different light. So the first study we did here uh, was about paper groups. In 2009, the New York Times published an article written by Leslie Kaufman uh, it said if you use that soft, fluffy toilet paper that we all like, it turns out that paper is made from non-recycled pulp. That non-recycled pulp, 50% of it comes from second growth forest, 10% of it comes from virgin trees, old growth forest, a lot of them in Canada. So we are deforesting, you know, pretty intense trees that have been around for some time for a task that's probably not so essential. So our comes out in 2009, nothing really changes. I live in San Francisco, the crunchiest place on the planet. Many stores don't sell recycled toilet paper. Uh, the ones that do, you've got to hunt and peck for it. Why do we continue to deforest for something that's probably not essential? So uh, in our group of studies, and again, Sun Juan was the lead on this work, everybody got the stats I just gave you. And then we had three experimental groups. One group read a beautifully written narrative of what we like to cut down a tree. The second watched a video that was shot from the shoulder of a lumberjack. The third put on the helmet and had what's called a haptic device. It was a a device that shook their arms and they had a chainsaw where they had to cut down two trees. Uh, when the trees land, the floor thunders up. It's really intense, really intense. So people are coming to my lab, I get calls four months later and someone will say, Jeremy, I went to the toilet paper aisle and I thought about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that. Um, but we never trust self-report. So in our studies, we had pre-post measures. Do you plan on using less paper after this experience? Everyone chose a reduction in, uh, in their intended paper use. But only the VR group changes. They, we find a way to me measure their paper use afterward, a 20% reduction in the amount of paper use. So all of us want to be green, right? Talk is cheap, right? It's, it's really hard to change behavior. It's easy to say that behavior. So the VR group uses 20% less paper. The others don't change despite the fact that everyone says they want to. Now, what I want you to think about, and I see I'll get you in a second. Uh, what I want you to think about is if I were to teach you deforestation, by forcing you to go outside and cut down two of those beautiful trees that have been here for uh, 80 years, uh, 120 years, that'd be a really bad way to teach deforestation. And VR, that's this counterproductive bucket, right? You get the experience, it changes your behavior, but you don't have to kill something. Yes? How do you measure change in toilet paper use? Um, there's a few different ways. So I, when, when I give a talk like this, I, I put up an image and I'm really describing like two dissertations and four or five published papers uh, pretty quickly. In uh, the first one, it was uh, she faked uh, a spill and it's measured to see how much how many napkins you used. Uh, that was a short term one. Longer term, we um, we do things like we we actually install sensors in people's sinks and measure how much water they use if we're doing water instead of paper. We try to we try to measure behavior in ways that are unobtrusive and, and it really changes from study to study. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the.
the ocean for uh, a bit of time here. Um, how many of you guys have heard of ocean acidification? It's okay if you have this. Uh, most smart people have. Uh, or, or if you raise your hand. Uh, that, and that's about correct in any size group. What Dr. Lachenko called ocean acidification, global warming is an evil twin. Uh, so I'm going to teach you one useful thing today. Uh, when humans produce CO2, about a third of it gets absorbed by the ocean. When that happens, the water becomes, uh, the pH levels of the water go down. So the same way when you add CO2 to water, it gets a little more acidic, it becomes seltzer. It's a little acidic. That's what happens to the ocean when they absorb one third of the human produced CO2. So when the water becomes more acidic, really bad things happen. How do we know? Uh, because there's two sites in the world. One's in Papua New Guinea, uh, where I was just fairly recently. And this one is an island called Ischia, which is off the coast of Naples, Italy. And Ischia has these underwater volcanic vents that seep. And unlike most volcanic vents, they don't have any toxic chemicals like sulfur or methane. And they don't change the temperature of the water. So you literally can attribute the changes in the reef simply to the percentage of CO2 that's in the water. So think of this spot as a crystal ball. It shows the future of all of our oceans. When you're right on it, you're at the year, this is I think year 2100 or 2200, depending on where you are in there. When you step you know, 10 meters away from it, you're down to 2050. And there's a great metaphor, which is functional, from distance and time. So you can predict what all the world's oceans are going to look like by the year 2100, based on how close you get to this reef. Is that fair? Make sense? So I got a very generous grant from the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, and I work with Phil McKelly, because she's the brilliant marine scientist this work is based on, and Roy P., who's just a, a fantastic educational technologist. And we iterated, to say we put in 2,000 hours on this, uh, 10,000 hours we put on this, and 20 different versions, and it was just brutal getting the models back from programmers, and it looked like Finding Nemo. And then my marine scientists say, no, that's how the Mediterranean looks like. It doesn't look like that. And then educational technologists say, no, you should, you should, be, you should you need to be able to pick that up. Because you, know, you learn by doing And then the marine scientists say, how dare you pick up that sea snail? You're hurt. <laughs> uh, so there's, it, there's a lot of iterations. And where my role was is I just know what good PR feels like. So, uh, so this is really uh, it started out as a design project. And uh, we spent a lot of time on design. Of course, we tested it. Uh, we put it in high schools. We put it in colleges, we put it in large adult informal learning contexts. I've, I've probably run thousands and thousands of people uh, through this now. We've done some really fun things with it. So in addition to running pre post learning, uh, which we do show that people learn from it, obviously, um, we've done, we, this was, uh, an, it was a movie at the 2016 Primac Film Festival where we had, um, at the film festival there's an arcade, and they have, um, Thousands of people come through. It's open 11 hours a day for seven days a week. And one of the neat things we can talk about this as a tool for learning and, and the you know the influences that cause better retention, etc., based on experiential learning. But there's a motivation factor. I had a line of 100 people for 11 hour days for seven days straight to learn about chemistry. Right? You don't get that with a textbook on a table. And perhaps a novelty that will wear off. Uh, but in my experience, it, 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 it's it's not. And so that's really neat. We also brought this. Uh, to the U.S. Senate. We dragged, we dragged all of our hardware uh, to the Senate, and we set it up on, on, on the, uh, in the visitor center, and we had uh, members come through and congresswomen and congressmen, and we got to actually take the senators through uh, and show them this. And, and why I talk about that, because it's going to lead into the next project that we're doing. So for us, the senators did it, and it was just, and it was fine. It was neat. The next thing I want to talk about is Palau. How many of you guys have heard of Palau? Okay. Palau is a small nation in Micronesia. It's about the size of, I would guess, you know, Gainesville. It's uh, land-wise, it's not that big, but because of how nautical law works, they own a chunk of ocean the size of France. That chunk of ocean is famed for two reasons. One, uh, it's the most spectacular, thriving piece of coral that exists right now. It's been more resilient than a lot of other places. And two, uh, the entire nation is really threatened by sea level rise and other forms of climate change. So it's this very special place to go and study. Um, my lab manager, Tobin, and our project manager, Elise, and I went on a Stanford trip run by uh, an amazing marine scientist named Rob Dunbar. And there was a Stanford C class where I got to piggyback on the boat with Rob Dunbar, who's <laughs> taking us to all the spots in the reef that show these trigger points of climate change. So, a little country like Palau, they can't change CO2, right? They, they're, 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 their population is 20,000 people. 
So they can't change CO2 levels. The only thing they can do is they can adapt. How do they adapt? They can limit tourism. They can stop commercial farming because when they cut down the mangroves, sediment goes into the water and that causes damage to the reefs. And they can uh, uh, stop overfishing because overfishing when it is uniquely stressful when the water is warmer, et cetera. So that, those are basically things, things we can do. Uh, the point of this story is when I went to the U.S. Senate, it was an honor to be there. It was awesome and it was humbling. But nothing happened. What we did here is we went to Palau and we filmed all this great stuff underwater. We, you know, I had my whole team there. We were at Palau. We went to the government of Palau where there are, uh, I think, 12 senators and 20, uh, about, about a dozen senators and about two dozen House delegates. And there was a briefing where two thirds of the board, so it was, it was an official session of their government. And I took them one by one. We had about half of them go through. And this is what I built for them. I went to them and I was going it all the work actually that I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we went to this place called Soft Coral Arch. Oh, so the other thing you need to know about Palau, um, they get five times as many tourists each year that they have a population. The tourists come to see the ocean. It's an amazing destination of divers and arborist fishers. Their economy is really based on the ocean more than more than any other fact that goes into it. So uh, but here's the neat thing about the senators. The, the culture of Palau, not many people go on the water. Some are afraid of sharks. A lot of them like to fish, but this idea that we go there to dive and see the ocean, that's just not, it's not part of what they do. Of the 12 cent, of the 12 lawmakers I ran, only one had been in the water other than we. Okay. So they didn't see this. So there's a neat background there. So soft coral arch is most coral reefs, they don't have shape. They're just in the sun. Soft coral arch is this rocky arch that because of the arch, uh, it's shady and it's part of the coral that you don't see anywhere off this really long, flowery coral grows. And it's one of the reasons tourists come is to see this spot. This spot is you know, the size of this room, maybe twice the size of this room. And uh, we got there at like 7 45 a.m. We set up all of our underwater rig and captured this amazing pristine footage. And at 8 sharp, we had the first boat of tourists come in. And these tourists couldn't swim. They all had fins on and they're all clinging to this. Um, this kind of floaty life, life, life raft type thing. And what you saw is them just, as they went through this arch, their feet just trashing this coral, knocking it into the water. And, we, and that happens 10 times a day. Right? So that, that was the first one. But we filmed it. And so what we did for the House delegates and the senators, we put them in the yard. And we had to look down. And first of all, we had to look around. Oh, it's amazing. And so that part was astonishing then because most of them hadn't been there. And this is one of the most important places in their reef and hence their economy. And then I said, look at this one piece of orange coral, and we hit a button and we brought in tourists. We swapped the video, and the reactions were really intense. That day, there was a resolution passed uh, specifically about how the government of Laos was going to work with the climate change scientists. Now, the VR was one small part of that and probably had only a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of influence, but the point is, is we had access to half the government. They all did it, and that day they did something about climate change. And you know, obviously in our country things uh, are at a scale that it's a little bit more complicated, and, and there's there's obviously political issues. But boy, wouldn't it be great to give all of our lawmakers an experience? How are we on time, Shri? Maybe another 10, 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So that's uh, yes. So how Hirschfield, uh, one of uh, Laura Carson sends grad students. She's a professor in psychology. Uh, how did his dissertation in my lab where the question that he was consumed by was one raised by a philosopher, Parfit. Humans were very good at imagining pleasure right now. All of us are happy. We're going to get out of this talk. We're going to have some dinner. We're going to have a beer. We're going to watch a baseball game. What's hard to imagine is pain in the future. That it's hard to get people to defer gratification, to defer pleasure now, to avoid pain later on. So how's we run 20, 30 studies. He's now a professor in the business school at UCLA. Uh, trying to defer gratification by connecting someone to their future self. And so how studies could absolutely walk up to the virtual mirror and you would do the body transfer I talked about. But in this study, we had to scan your body and then we used a computer graphics algorithm to age you so that you'd see your 20-ish and you'd see what you look like when you're gonna be 65 and then we did the body transfer. Now, uh, the neat thing here uh, from an application standpoint, it's not very neat, 20-somethings are not putting any money in the bank. So the actual math tables say that when 20-somethings become 60 or 70, 
they're going to be poverty because they are not saving money. And it gets worse because the 20 somethings now are going to live to their 90. And there's probably not going to be Social Security. So uh, the macro people are very freaked out about this. And so anything you can do to get somebody to put money in the bank is a great thing. And our studies, what we do is we give them the option here's some money now, or put it in your savings account later on, we'll give you more. And is somebody willing to defer that gratification? So I will uh, not go into all the details of the studies. I was published a bunch of them. Uh, showing that this compared to just about every control condition you can think of causes people to defer gratification and actually save more. Um, the fun thing has been taking this now and actually working with the financial institutions to have them build this. So I'll talk about this one, uh, which is very public, but there's about a dozen that are doing similar things at this point. Um, and this is face retirement, and Bank of America Merrill Lynch figured out a way from a camera and a webcam to scan your face, build a 3D model of you, and so here's your 35, and here's your 67, and then when you do online banking, your future self is part of the interface. So every financial decision you make, your future self is staring at you. Okay? <laughs> What's that? Um, I have a question about this. Can I finish talking about it first? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, so your future self is staring at you, and the more you put into savings, the happier your future self gets. Okay, so they built this interactivity to reward you in a, in a way that leverages lots of things that you know about psychology to encourage you to save. And uh, what I'm allowed to say is the data, I mean, without giving specific numbers, because they don't give me those specific numbers, they love this. Uh, it's, it's one of these amazing win wins, right? BMA makes money because you're putting money in the bank, but people are saving more money and it's been a really good tool. Yeah? So, um, in your early part of the presentation, when you were talking about being in somebody else's body, mm -hmm. there was a protocol associated with this body transfer. Yeah. And it sounds like this works even without that, uh, going through that uh, you know, set of steps to cognitively rethink. Yeah. So can you uh, provide some... Uh, if you have an external representation, there's about five things that can do, do what's called self-presence. They can look like you, mm -hmm. you can choose it, <clears throat> it can okay. move with you, mm -hmm. uh, Simultaneous, simultaneous things can happen to you and it, for example, the poking, mm -hmm. uh, and you can share the same perspective of it from a perceptual standpoint. First one, I'm probably missing a couple, but um, mm -hmm. off the top of my head, those are the five ways that I'm remembering of scientists trying to do it. Um, the way that works by far the strongest, according to Slater, who studies this mostly, is the synchronous binding. So that's the home run. You just can't do that at scale. And so what, what B of A did is they just figured trying to do this with the you know, it's mostly it looks like you, but you're also choosing it. You get to do a couple things, and we know that these choices really influence. Uh, and, uh, and again, I don't have their back end numbers and how it's working, but no. oh, thank you. But it's a great topic for the reason. I mean, so, so many unanswered questions there. That's good. Okay, the final example before I hope we have questions. Um, I want to talk about football. We're 100 meters from a pretty special place here, right? So, uh, Stadium, and so this is the story of Derek Belch. Uh, Derek took my virtual people class in the year 2005, and he said to me, Jeremy, at the end of class, can we use VR to train athletes? And I said, Derek, it's a brilliant idea. We'll come back in a decade when the technology's ready because it's just not ready yet. So he did. He came back and got his master's with me in the 2013-2014 season while he was an assistant coach working with David Shaw. Uh, on the football team, and uh, at the time, it's what's called spherical video, which is not computer graphic based VR, but you know, using a sea of cameras to capture a scene. It's very hard to do, but it was, you're just able to do it. And Derek somehow convinced Coach Shaw, who's a, a really forward thinking great guy, to give us five minutes of practice time on Monday. So coaches choreographed practice down to 30 seconds, and they thought for five minutes on Monday, he'd let us drag our rig on the field have the quarterback step off and put the rig where the quarterback would be. Our defense would pretend to be the team we were playing that Saturday, and they would put up you know, 10 to 15 tricky plays that are packages that we thought we'd see, blitzes that we know the team likes to run. Then we'd go back to the lab and we'd feverishly stitch this together and get it ready. By Wednesday, we'd put it in the football office, and then the players would train. And what they would train is we were not teaching how to kick or how to throw. We were teaching them to make a decision. So the quarterback goes to the line scrum, he just goes in, he's basically got three things he can do. He can let it roll, which is keep the original play, he can kill, 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 which is go to the next play down the queue, or he can ask one of his running backs to move to pick up the block. So he's got about three parameters that, that he can move with. All of this happens very quickly uh, while the defense is running around and while all the fans are training. So uh, that's the training decision making. 
after three weeks, Coach Sean made mandatory for all the players. It was working so well. Uh, our team outperformed uh, expectations that season. Of course, I would never claim any credit for anything that our players would do. Our quarterback for that year, Kevin Hogan, he claims the best four games he's ever played uh, in his career were after he used that. Of course, uh, we, we try to diminish that, but uh, this is Kevin's quote. Derek graduates on January 2nd, 2015. Sports a startup called Striver on January 3rd, proceeds to sign six NFL teams that year to multi-year contracts with the PR. Uh, this is Carson Palmer with the system in his house. Uh, and what Striver, this company that uses VR for training, it just becomes this prolific growth. And there's 20 college teams using it. NFL, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to go into too many details. Uh, here are some of the teams that we're working with. They're working with the German national football team now with innovating all sorts of spectacular uses. It is one of the neatest, you know, I've been doing VR for a while. It's one of the neatest times you've ever seen it actually be used, you know, getting away from this. Boy, it would be cool if we could do this. We're seeing these people use it. And, um, in what is likely the first democratization of actual VR that's good, Walmart has now, so Walmart has 200 training academies. Every academy, you can't work for Walmart and not be able to drive to one of these academies. They place them special. Every employee, when you get hired or promoted, goes there for a two week boot camp, uh, or a one week boot camp. And we've now put VR training in every single Walmart academy. 140,000 people this year put on a helmet, and Walmart, they just announced this. The reason this is not on the slide is that we've been working with them for about over a year, and they just announced it a few months ago publicly that. If you are a Walmart employee, you get to go, and, and what do you use it for? Uh, the person at the deli counter, he's got to look around and, you know, I check the customer. Is there a sharp knife out? Uh, the manager's got to practice having a difficult conversation with the employee. Uh, the person on, on the, the food aisle, is it something stacked wrong? And uh, they are, again, they don't give us the back-end data, but they've got a really specific way of tracking the success of the technology, and it is working. It's getting these employees into situations that are rare. So uh, the funnest example for this, uh, funnest for me because I don't have to work on that day, is Holiday Rush. Uh, what some people call Black Friday, well, of course, Holiday Rush. You put this on, and there's a zillion people there, and they're all screaming at you. And we actually took footage on, hol on Holiday Rush in a Walmart, and nothing prepared you for that. And what we have is the CEO saying, we can now prepare you for that. So you know, it's a neat problem. So I want to respect and leave time for question and answer. Um, VR is here, technologically, economically. Don't treat it like a media experience. The brain, you know, it's probably closer to an actual one. And hopefully, we can brainstorm ways in the Q and A to, to, to help think your issues. Questions? Yeah. It's so interesting to me, like the majority of these have to do with emotional context. Further than that, it, it also seems that a lot of these have to do with not observing how people react or any kind of basic research, but it's applied research. So can you put that into context for me? I want to make sure that that's what we're talking about. That we're encouraging certain behaviors or certain perspectives as determined by people who create these. So the narrative of this talk is kind of does have an applied bent to it. I, I probably publish 10 to 15 journal articles a year that are, that are highly theoretical. All of these things, for example, the tree cutting paper is motivated by something called locus of control. The, the age study, it really begins with this idea of self-efficacy. And, and so the work tends to be, when we do the domain work, we tend to use the theory of the domain. Um, we also develop theories of VR. Um, I don't talk about them much because they're kind of, they're early, uh, is, uh, so when you think about theories of what is presence and, and what is, you know, things like media richness and uh, there, it's, so we also do work in the domain of media on the theoretical side, but uh, you know, I, I, when I first got into VR, there was this maddening, in my own opinion, just back and forth on what is presence and what is immersion and, and this, these labeling. And I said, you know, let's just do stuff. I want to do stuff. And so I do have a doing stuff bent now that I'll never get evaluated again if I stand around and say that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pardon my English, it's not very really fast, I speak slowly. So uh, the question you asked to ask, how can it help me? So I'm doing my research on um, cancer uh, cancer communication in the developing world. I come from Bangladesh, which is one of the poorest and uh, one of the densest countries in the world. 
and we have we don't have hospitals in rural areas. So my research is stuck at a point that how do you build infrastructure to help rural people to get cancer screening and cancer cancer treatment? And while listening to your lecture, it came into my mind how VR can work in that scenario. Is there any literature that has been done in this area in health communication with VR? Where so the, the, the growing medical applications of VR are massive. Uh, in terms of screening, you know, so I, I don't know a bunch on screen. So where VR comes in very handy for screening is what, when body movements are a part of it. So for example, because you're moving around in VR and we record every micro movement uh, 90 frames a second at a very high accuracy rate. So if you're trying to diagnose, uh, you know, disorders that have movement associated as a symptom, it works really well to put them in situations that where they do stuff. Um, the, you know, when we get into the medical domains, where I really like to talk about is, there's two projects that I like to talk about. One is about pain reduction. So presence in VR is necessarily uh, trades off with actions in the physical world, which is why I'm worried about strategy people walking around. It turns out one of the home run applications discovered in 95 by Hunter Hoffman at the University of Washington is that you can use VR to reduce physical pain. So he had burn victims' bets when you change their bandages. This acute pain opioids don't dent it. In VR, when you put them in snow world, uh, the subjective perception of pain goes down by like 70%. Massive, massive effects. The other thing that, that this project that I'm working on with, with a, a woman named Ann Lubin at Stanford, kids who are going in for pediatric surgery, what we built is, or what they've built with uh, my very small participation is, uh, kids basically get to visit the hospital in VR. They get to go to the waiting room, they get to see their anesthesiologist. We've actually built a way for them to do breathing practice inside. Um, so it's a, basically a, a pre inoculation of stress reduction so that when they actually get there, they're not so freaked out. Yeah. I have a follow up. Yes, of course, it has to have a financial benefit to the providers. So when it comes to developing countries, which are inherently poor as well, so what can be a financial model to improve VR technology? So I threw a conference in Los Angeles in 2016 where I brought the, the eight most brilliant women and men that study VR medicine. And I brought the FDA and I brought insurance adjusters and we had you know, decision makers and I just tried to get them to get along. Like, so how, how, many guys have, how, how many guys have heard of the VR pain research before today? Like this is, I call it the worst kept secret in VR. Like, like there's 100 studies published, four or five of them large sample, random, random, random assignment trials. Like, it works. You know, it's not always 70%, but it's typically in the 25% range when you look at the meta-analysis. VR reduces pain. We have an opioid crisis. Let's stop using drugs for everything and try VR for certain cases. So, um, uh, but when, I, when I threw this conference, there's all sorts of smart people who've got to figure out regulation and, and money strategies. I'm just trying to get the people aware. You know, I, Hunter's work was in 1995. Like, Skip Rizzo's been using VR to treat post-traumatic stress disorder in vets uh, for over close to 30 years, and whenever I give talks, they say, that's really neat that, 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 that you can use VR to treat best for PTSD. Why does nobody know this? So um, I believe there's a, there's a money issue that somebody's got to solve. Um, you know, we've been trying to, uh, to get big drug companies to believe that um, it's within their wheelhouse to be the VR folks, too. Like, that's just another way to reduce pain, and they can, a pharmaceutical company can also have VR. That's kind of how I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. Please, okay. Um, I wonder if you want to be across any uh, ethical issues or problems with IRB because these are such intense personal experiences. You know, we uh, so there's a. I'll just give an example from what I'm working on now. Uh, Courtney Cogburn, my colleague at Columbia, she's a professor of ethnic studying race, um, uh, specializing in black white racism, and we've built. Uh, it's about a 12 minute journey where you know what she wanted to do was to create an experience where you. It's not just, you know, somebody says a nasty thing to you once, racism is something you deal with all throughout your life. So you start out as a, as a seven-year-old, and you're in school, and the kids are ostracizing you, and then the teacher punches you for something but not the other kids. Uh, scene two, so there's also scene three where you have a, you go for a job interview and, and, and you don't get the job and for various reasons. It's scene two that we've had some problems with for when people of color go through it because it's a stop and frisk scene. And you actually have to be down on your hands and knees and put your hands up, and uh, the cops just really berate you. And these are all based on uh, not just true stories, but documented experiences of, of, of that come from film. And, 
and we've had some people. That's the first time that I've ever built something that um, had some reactions that made me think it's not not that it's not worth the outcome, but that we have to dial that back. But uh, from the IRB, you know, when I talk to the IRB, I say from a media effect standpoint, right? Let me just rerun the the media effects technology lab here. We care about how media affects people, and when you put what I do against Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, you know, on a scale from one to ten, where they're a hundred, we're we're like a one and a half, right? So it's uh, understanding what this stuff's going to do to you is worth, you know, in my opinion, uh, some stuff. Of course, there's lots of it. But it seems like the answer is sudden. These things are going to have long-term implications on who I think they are and the way I live. And so, for example, if you take me through the pit, and I was not pulled up to heights beforehand, after your experience, I may be. If you take me through the training on being African-American and being dressed by cops, I might not have been afraid of cops beforehand, but it might be afterwards. And so you're afraid or concerned about how you're going to change the way people perceive themselves and their worlds in a more negative way? So I, I, think, I think it's really important to be careful with this stuff, mm -hmm. but I think the problems are worth solving. Um, so uh, the, the way that, so let's go out of race for a second and go to climate change. The way that we produce the experience was we talked to in the design phase, hundreds and hundreds of people on all sorts of expert domains. And, and you know, so one of my jobs, uh, and I haven't done this yet, but it's, you know, my work is, my, my lab is funded by three branches, the military, uh, and I, I love our police officers and, our, and, our, and the people that fight for our country. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got, my next step is to, you know, show that to cops, right? Because that's part of it, right? That's part of the domain expertise. Uh, so that's, uh, this stuff is hard, right? Yeah. Uh, we never talk race, it's hard. Uh, so, uh, but your bigger question, does VR change behavior? Yes. In my opinion, is going to work differently on different people. Probably, uh, do we hold video and words to the same standard? No. Um, is VR qualitatively different than those things? I think so. So stream of consciousness. Uh, so my job is to, you know, these things are out there, and you know, one one nice thing that we've seen is that the, this kind of first person concept people were building for VR, which which was pretty intense. My own video games, those aren't all that popular, uh, and so. Well, like even when you talk about pain, I mean, we know that as you, as you give people opioids for pain or other sorts of treatments for pain, you adapt. And so I wonder, does virtual reality get people to become, adapt to their pain? So when you take the virtual reality away, in fact, they feel more pain than before they engage in the virtual reality, just like any other drug. So in my lab, every time we run a study, we always look at longitudinal effects. Mm -hmm. That's part of the kind of requirements to do the work. Uh, but what we don't do, what we need to do is look at multiple doses. Uh, that's not. That's hard to be done. I mean, there, there is a literature on this from the phobia treatment. Uh, for example, it takes 10 sessions to overcome your fear of spiders. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and showing that, you know, the question of what is the tolerance in VR experiences is nobody knows. Yeah. Um, so, my question is to do with the follow up effect. Mm -hmm. um, there are two ends of the spectrum as far as experience is concerned. So one end is kind of going to Lake Alice to experience the lake. It's not entirely at your own pace. Uh -huh. And the other end of the spectrum is um, watching born identity. Not at all at my own pace, but very powerful. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about virtual experiences that have been very effective in changing behavior, yeah. where do those experiences lie? Which, what do you find is most effective? Um, the maddening. So the ironic thing about what's happening in VR is that two failing industries, two struggling industries, film and journalism, are thinking that VR is their answer. Uh, but storytelling is really hard in VR. Right? And we can talk about all the differences why. So I gave I gave the keynote of that address at a very large film festival and I looked at the audience to all these actors and directors and I said, do not screw up movies with VR. You guys are brilliant at what you do. Okay, you get to control where the person's looking, right? So when you think about this idea of filmmaking, a plant and payoff, which is, you know, you notice that the, this bottle there, and that's how I, I know that she's the bad guy. And, and, but, 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 and, but, and, and VR, I'm looking for those lights are really cool, but I don't see the bottle. So how do you solve that? You know, I believe, you know, and maybe the tolerance effect will have this, but I don't think. I love watching zombie stuff. It's a guilty pleasure. I watch Walking Dead. I watch Romero movies. I don't want that VR. Like, I don't want to feel that zombie. I want to <laughs> yeah. you know, smell the, the stinking flesh. Like I like that level of separation. So uh, I, I think film is just an amazing medium, and 
uh, and it should, you know, look, I, I argue with colleagues about this every day. Uh, it's just, I don't, I don't see the bridge. That being said, Hollywood is important. Lots of money. As you guys know, in the journalism store, the college here, uh, journalism, every organization is trying to tie hard the most. Yeah. Since you mentioned kind of that model. Yes. <laughs> so, when people talk about VR experiences, part of it is about the experience, the sensory stimuli, and the sense of presence. But part of it is about interactivity. So, given that when people used to talk about virtual experiences, they talk about games and simulations, what is it about VR that really differentiates from simulation like flight simulation or, or video game experience, where you are, there are some level of sensory and you have the interactivity. So, um, Byron Reeves' advisee is Jim Cummings. He's now an assistant professor at Boston University. He and I published a meta analysis together that looked at. I published that. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I see yeah, you got a friendly editor. Yeah, friendly editor. Uh, that looked at every single paper that's ever looked at the features of the technology, things like field of view, interactivity, number of degrees we have track, resolution, everything you can think of. About 80 published studies and a lot that weren't published and basically computer events outside. Um, happy to talk about the specific results of that, but as, 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 as typically happens when you do a, a meta analysis, the results are you know, nuanced. Uh, update rate matters a lot, number of degrees. So, Interactivity features matter a lot. Uh, stereo doesn't matter as much as you think. Uh, resolution matters a lot less than you think. So the features kind of line up. My intuition and experience that the more the more you're doing, a lot of the fears drive our work. And we look at body cognition uh, to drive a lot of our effects. And so to me, the more you get that body moving, uh, for example, with our ocean studies, um, what I didn't mention about Stanford, the Purdue ocean certification experience, you know, we run thousands of subjects through that, and we can measure how effective it is, but you get all the track to that, meaning you get it, did they pick up four snails or eight snails? Or did they walk, you know, three meters? Or and or what we can do is come up with this metric of exploration or play uh, based on how long well they move, and you can actually correlate learning with the amount of, of, of movement. But then look, this field when I, when I, we were talking earlier about the, the theory of the media immersion. So the, Slater uh, has convinced the world we're going to call immersion the hardware and then presence the subjective response. <clears throat> the, the, the field of trying to relate those two and to figure out how important uh, each of those features are, it's ongoing. It's very ongoing. Yeah. I'm a visual designer working on a study of VR with delirium patients, and I was wondering if in your work or work with your colleagues you've ever come across any sort of uh, visual design techniques that would help with VR in terms of trying to engage a user in a certain experience or distract them from a certain experience. Like, is hyperrealism always the end goal with VR, or does really distorted visuals help with certain other sort of outcomes? Do you, are you aware of any sort of research on that sort of topic? Um, so I can I can speak specifically to the level of photographic realism. Have you read the Blaskovich uh, 2002 psych inquiry paper on uh, his model of social influence? No, I haven't. He pits realism uh, against other features. So I read a lot of Jim's work, Jim Blaskovich, on that. So. Uh, in general, movement is always uh, movement tends to be more important than having it look great. Uh, appearance uh, less important than behavior is kind of a theme that pops there. Um, but obviously, the domain is important, and, and I don't know that much about your patients to, to, to be able to speak intelligently about, about what we're I'm happy to talk, talk to you more offline and describe what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, in terms of effectiveness, uh, so in your experience, how what's the difference between photorealism and like studies of the uh, NFL versus yeah. like 3D model environments. So the NFL, when Derek and I were figuring out what we're going to do, you know, in particular, a quarterback makes a decision because somebody flexes a, a, a wrist muscle and they see that cue and, uh, and that changes everything. And so we chose to go through the video as opposed to CG, not because there's an inherent difference, but tracking every possible movement on a person and then rendering it appropriately on a CG avatar is still not possible. Uh, to do. So for us, the reason why we chose video was not because we cared about photorealism in of itself, but because photorealism is necessary to convey the body movements where the people were getting their learning cues from. Um, in general, the benefit of CG is you get to do stuff. It's interactive, and the benefit of the video is it's cheap, and it looks real. Right? So for, you know, for, for example, these with, with the allowing uh, lawmakers, you know, the wow factor of them seeing real fish swim up and then 
wasn't you know a video game that was important to them. You know, they're they're signing a bill that day. So there's some context where you know even even the best CG, which I you know in my lab almost exclusively the CG, still looks a little bit of So you know there's some point there's a there's kind of a bias against seeing the things on. That's time for one last question. Anybody? One last question. If not, let me just make a quick plug for uh, Jeremy's talk tomorrow, if you want a double dose of Jeremy. He's also the keynote speaker at the Climate Change Summit tomorrow, which is going to be held at the Rights Union, the Rion Ballroom. Uh, that's from 2 to 4.30. Uh, so there the talk will be focused exclusively on uh, some of the work that he's doing in his lab with climate change, uh, some of which he touched upon today. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Thanks,